Here we are. Hello, everybody. Oh, I like a little skeet that. I'll get into that in a second. And welcome to the Roach Wiggle, March 21st, 2024. Bring the mic a little bit closer. Not that close. We got LC, JoJo Bugs, Zen Monkeys here, Stephen Logan, Luch Garden State Bugs and Pods. Hello. Well, we were just talking on, uh, on text. Um, let's see. So I'm, uh, I, today was, I, I'm, I'm all out of sorts. I don't have my car, my car. I dropped off on Monday. I've been basically, I have been just trapped at my house since Monday <laughs> and, uh, just working stuff outside. I did got orders ready for next week. All this stuff I have, you know, just stuff that I can plan ahead. Uh, emails, blah, blah, blah. The office has been fed. It has been cleaned, etc. cetera. Uh, are the days designated for what's going to be auctioned for each yet? Yes, uh, Stephen, really fast. We'll get into that. Uh, Satchel and Braden, hello. Uh, we have the days and whatnot for the auction are set. That material is in the Discord. It is on Roach Crossing. I pushed the update through on the old Roach Crossing uh, there is no new roach crossing yet. It is progress is happening behind the scenes as always. Um, but on the front page of, uh, of roach crossing, there is an image. There's a blog post uh, with the details. Everything's everything's decided. Hey, Elliot, good to see you. Uh, Jojo, so I have the auction day. I was moving the original dates for my first expo dates. I almost died a little inside. Had a hell of a snail day today. Sorting them now, Satchel, you are doing God's work with those Alabama snail propagations. So anyways, yes, the auction, it's decided. It's all the promotional materials made. I appreciate if anybody distributes it anywhere, Facebook, whatever. That's really the only one I can think of. Uh, Dynamo Terror, it's been a while. Good to see you. So, uh, so yeah, the auction is going to be April 5th, 6th, 7th, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. all three days. Bunch of stuff. We've got uh, some new K. We've got a new category. We're doing snakes on Sunday. Some good um, locality colubrids, rare colubrid species on Sunday. How many snakes? I think somewhere between 5 and 15. It's really up to Kim. He's going to be bringing them on um, Saturday night. I don't know everything. We're going to have some uh, locality uh, special subspecies of milk snakes. Um, there will be Asclepian Rat snakes, which is another very um, – thank you, Exotic Wilderness. I really appreciate that. Um, Asclepian rat snakes, which are really not seen ever. Uh, I'm trying to – I suck at spelling Asclepian. Uh, Asclepian, just the word Asclepian. Um, so those, as some of you may remember, that I, I got a trio of Asclepians from him two years ago. Phenomenal snakes, still doing well. One of them actually got out. I, uh, I was still figuring out cage clamps, and uh, one of the females got out and was gone for, I don't know, three to six months, and I found it like two weeks ago drinking water out of the sink in the basement, uh, apparently larger than it was when it left. So... Um, yeah, I was. Uh, it's, if you you wanna you wanna see some snakes you don't often see for sale, uh, and some good quality locality stuff. Kim is exceptional. You will not have picky eaters. Uh, you will not have any health issues with these snakes. I will even go so far as to guarantee that with Kim stock stock it is top shelf stuff. So it was free eating free range roaches. I think it was probably competing with Baloo for uh, free range uh, rodents, because uh, yeah, there is there's 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 some of those in the house. So white footed mice get in from outside, and every once in a while, while I'm cleaning stuff, one of the um, one of my feeder mouse lines will just go berserk and will jump out of my hand and fall between the washer and the dryer, and then it's like, okay, well, that's a lost cause. So. Um, yeah, it's good to see everybody. We got a lot of people in the stream already. Uh, I have a lot to talk. I mean, you know, I don't know if it was losing my car that kind of like got my brain in a different headspace. Um, but uh, oh, I forgot to say why I'm so shook up. So my 
my schedule's been all deviated. I've been doing stuff at weird hours. Angela hasn't been here. She's been at her, been at her place. She's coming over. She's supposed to come over yet tomorrow. And uh, ended up, she has a client booked for that book last minute for a Saturday um, massage set, massage session. And so she's going to be coming over later on um, Saturday. We're going to go do a nice spa day thing to relax. And then we're going to go see goats on Sunday to uh, pick up. I don't know. We're probably not going to pick them up on Sunday because I we don't even have a car big enough for them. But um, I think pretty soon baby goats are due and I want to get bottle babies. So a lot of things are moving very fast. And uh, that's where we are. But anyways, <clears throat> My neighbor down the street who does all the permaculture stuff, I talk about him occasionally, Joe. Uh, he had a bunch of trees taken down at his yard to get more sun. He had a bunch of huge box elders along the fence. Some of them rotted out heartwood, all that stuff. So two or three years ago, he had them all cut down. He wanted them to leave the wood. There were some black cherries in the fence line, some black walnut. He wanted to slab those. So he's uh, he's got all that, all this wood that's just been sitting there, like huge uh, three plus foot diameter pieces in some cases and it's all perfectly white and brown and red rotted and so I went over today because I had kind of a little gap in my schedule helped them cut some of it up brought it home need to sterilize it threw it in the oven threw too much in the oven uh, and so we had uh, you know we had some cooking some baking some beyond baking of the wood going on in there house was uh, filled with smoke had to deal with that it was Taking the hose from the uh, the sink and spraying it directly into the oven, you know all that fun stuff. And so uh, I'm a little bit disheveled because I was dealing with that up until about 15 minutes before we went live. So, uh, but good news is I have a bunch of uh, well sterilized uh, white and brown rot wood for millipede husbandry coming up next week, and uh, yeah, so that's that's that. It's actually been a, I mean, a very productive week without the car, and uh, I am just barely surviving in terms of. Uh, I mean, I mean, nah, I've got plenty of food, but it's like I feel the restriction of my freedom, and it's both. It is both freeing and also stressful because it's like, well, what if I need this? You know, I, I run out and get this. So Luch says I had that happen with the Asian water monitor, and he got into the wall and climbed from downstairs to upstairs through the sheetrock. I finally got him after a few weeks to a month and. Put him in cage. He got out again and tried to get him back in the wall, but was way fatter. Feed with reds this time, so he failed that time. That's hilarious. Um, any bugs on stream today? I'll probably bring some lubbers on stream. Uh, I'll probably do that in a little bit. Thank you for recommending that. We do need to get into that uh, sort of stuff. But <clears throat> uh, yeah, so I'll just take a take a second to uh, look at that promotional image. I put out a couple places again. Anyone is welcome to share them. Like you know, in the spring, I did like oh, share it and show me you shared it, and you'll get a percentage off. And honestly, that did not seem to to go anywhere. So this time, I'm just saying, hey, out of the kindness of your buggy heart, if you want to share this single .png file somewhere for the Bugapalooza, I would appreciate it. Anything that gets me to a thousand subscribers on YouTube uh, faster, because we're at like seven fifteen or something now. And I think it was a year ago in May when we hit 500, maybe 200s possible. You know, I could do some publicity stunt or something. But um, anyways, yeah, so we're just uh, – everything's in a state of, of flux right now. It's, it has me very agitated in a good way. Um, but everything's in a state of flux. And, wow, no, not really anybody saw the – the Nazi uh, short that I put up. It says only seven views. By the way, no, there's 14 Nazi. likes. Speak. So, wow, it's really easy to get a lot of views on shorts, I'm just noticing. Really easy. I'm going to have to get some more quality shorts of the dogs once I once I move. Anyways, um, so, so Luke just got some Spyro Strep to Servatius. I apologize to the auction attendees because uh, Alan was going to Send me some millipedes to auction off, and I have basically said, "Don't, don't auction those. I want to buy them." So uh, there's a couple of millipedes that will not be auctioned because I'm buying them from Alan instead. Sorry, guys. You'll get you'll get them eventually. Um, I shared in spring, just didn't say anything about. It. I'll get some shares on this. I appreciate again, everybody. I appreciate it. I know you're also kind of shooting yourselves in the foot because 
it uh, chips into your your opportunities to bid on stuff and and win publicity. So like seeing your kitchen on fire while sterilizing wood, you did. I was I was half tempted. I I realized that you know if I want to go all in with this, whatever you want to gesture broadly at the everything, um, maybe some more uh, snippets into the insanity of the day to day might drive up some interest, but. Um, I can't say much. I can should not say anything actually, but there's something big on the horizon that is not directly not going to be directly associated with Roach Cross. I mean, semi directly, but not. This is not like a hey guys, the Roach Crossing the movie is coming out in two months or something. But within the next six ish months, maybe more or maybe less, maybe more. I don't know. Uh, there is something big other than the move that is that is going to happen that is going to really, I think, push a lot of a lot of Roach stuff forward. I can't can't say much. Everybody here, you will be notified when this when this goes through. But um, there's something big on the horizon. I'm very excited for. And um, again, I can only put so much time into so many things at once. Um, no, it's not. It's not baby related. No, this is not pertinent. This is this is not pertinent to Angela and I. This is not pertinent to anything other than roaches. There is something big on the hor- on the horizon. Um, just set up a camera. I mean, I still have. He still ha- there. There's like. There's still dozens of logs back there for me to cut up and bring home to sterilize. So I could do it again. Um, I'm gonna just check and make sure none of the pieces I took out of the stove are on fire. So. Oh, yeah, nice and calm. Good, good. All right, yeah, so my kitchen's still there. So that's the good first sign. So, um, so yeah, we got goats within the next four weeks. That's going to happen. That's going to be a whole big thing, feeding three times a day. And uh, for, I think it's like a month or something, uh, so there's going to be that. There's going to be the auction going on. There's going to be, we have some traction on the move. Uh, I know I've been saying that for a while, and I've also been saying that when it happens, when the move happens, when it's about to happen, it's things are going to go. It's going to be pretty full speed ahead with stuff. So next Saturday, um, we're going to be we're we're, we're going to be uh, is is going to be a milestone for the the move stuff, and then uh, after that sort of gets figured out, it's going to be. Um, it's things things are just gonna this this next six months six months is gonna bring us to September the next seven months is just gonna be a blur a big fly just a big flyby drive by with everything that's gonna happen the building the barn fix up the goats the dogs the fencing the vegetables the all the the house all the stuff is just gonna be really nutty crazy and i really hope that by christmas time i can just sit here and relax the website the website thing is still is again i may not say oh yeah i did this today but next week since the florida trips and cancel again my car is gone for uh, at least two months probably more than four probably four or more um i will be getting a loan vehicle during that time but this is uh, the dealership is dealing with a lot of these issues and more. And so it's I got to wait for them to have a car available for me to use during that time. And there are, were not any when I dropped off my car. So it's I'm at the mercy of the next time something gets dropped off. And, you know, the sun is just at the perfect angle where uh, I don't want to rule out the natural light. I've missed it so much. But um, hello again, Joseph Tavir. Good to see you. Elsie says, I'm going west to San Diego where I think there might will be Aaron Vega, but don't know much on collecting. Could you give me some tips? Um, rodent burrows, accumulations of like matter under plywood or large pieces of trash under sheets of metal, uh, under trash cans on the beach, like up away from the water, like where there's all that ice plant. You know, you guys heard people found them underneath the trash cans sometimes. Up in the sand. I don't think you're allowed to destabilize the dunes, but you might find uh, some places where it's just all ice plant and nobody really cares or they don't. You're, you're, 
you're allowed to or it's no worse than people having, you know, walking there. Um, Elliot, stop the roaches when you got out of grad school. That's unfortunate. You should have kept the roaches and still dropped the grad school. Um, you can get back in at any time. That's part of why I'm here. Look at all this. Unless I drop dead tomorrow, all of this can be yours for the low, low price of however much it costs. <laughs> um, but let's see. So there's, there's, yeah, big stuff is happening, guys. Lots of big stuff. It's actually very intimidating because I don't know how up to it it's going to be. It's, I'm going to be, you know, to keep the ball rolling and all these things that need to happen and that I want to do. Um, I'm just realizing I left Discord up. We're going to just nix that real fast. Um, Kai has, has pinned my uh, my thing in somebody else's channel, one of his channels. I prayer his uh, Discord servers. I appreciate that. Um, there were other things I was going to talk about. Lighting my lighting my kitchen on fire. Um, house stuff. Obviously, all that stuff is is happening. I wish probably unlikely I drop that tomorrow, but it could could happen. Anything could happen anytime for any reason. Um. Let's see. Car complaining about my car. I already did that. <laughs> I also it's been a little intrusive thought the past maybe like month or two months when I come on here and I'm like, guys, I'm so stressed. I'm dying. That's awful. I just gotta get through. I just gotta get through this week. The next week, I just gotta get through this week. Um, I thought about how for the past almost two and a half, three years, I go and I um I copy paste the description for the video and you know, if there's like a giveaway or if there's something or if a guest or something, I'll edit the description. The, the, the description has pretty much been the same for the last year and a half and very similar to its in incarnation of two and a half years ago or whatever, where I just a carefree invertebrate or invertebrate logical chat. And then I come in here and I complain about all my, about all my cares and all this stuff sometimes. So I, uh, that's been in my head a couple of times. It's like, man, I say it's carefree, and then I come here and I spout about all these things I'm worrying about, and blah blah blah. But uh, somebody should graph. Somebody, maybe somebody, uh, Chris, Chris Snyder, or somebody else should uh, graph. See if you can go in to my live streams. I don't know how you do this. You have to watch every single one of them over again. But see if you can graph with, with you know, develop a scale of one to five. How stressed is Kyle? See if you can graph that and see if it comes and goes in cycles. Because I think right now I'm here. I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm so relaxed. All this stuff is happening. But I'm pretty chill about it and I'm excited and blah, blah, blah. I wonder if we're in that that little the little calm valley. And then two weeks, well, two weeks from now I'm going to be because it's going to be the auction. that's going to go all the way back up to here. And you know, I'm just curious if we get some maths on this, you know. Will you be traveling south at some point this year? It is it is out of my hands if I get my car back and depending on how fast the move stuff goes through, I really want to try and get down to like Florida, Alabama in, um, in uh, May or June. It's all dependent on how fast that car gets done. That's really the only determining factor. So um, I would love to, I want to do, we're supposed to, we're supposed to have our boys trip. Uh, boys with an eye because Jules was going with us, but um, that isn't isn't happening. It's not. I don't have a car. It's be. It would not be worth it for the amount of people and the amount of stuff we have to to rent a, a SUV for this type of trip. In my opinion, it's just too much to manage. So, Diana Terry says I've got a big female tennis hibernalis, but if I can't get her. To you, I may try finding a male tribrid. She may already be mated. Uh, in my experience with collecting tennis at this time of year, they are usually already mated. So, need to see correlation between Kyle's hair and his stress level. I would like to at some point commission somebody to go back and get like one frame from every single uh, weekly general of my face. And I kind of think it would be cool and a little morbid to see myself age in real time, you know, see the hair grow out and go back and stuff. But um, don't be stressed. You have bugs to make you happy. Taking care of bugs is makes me less stressed, but also more stressed. Because if something's not going right, then I have to correct it immediately. And if it's going right, then I just, ah, yeah, yay. I get the little hit of dopamine, and then I'm on to the next culture. And I like seeing stuff when I water it at night, too. 
Um, but I get a lot of satisfaction out of like, oh, I've never raised this before. Let's see if I can get to breed. Oh, it's super easy. This is so cool. Um, Chris is like the idea of uh, getting a still from every single live stream and uh, comparing my watching my face age in real time, maybe for a, a five year anniversary thing. But um, yeah, I, it, we got to get more subscribers so we can do another Roach Crossing after dark. I am actually kind of dying to do another one of those and i want to have a good defined goal for that um get back to az and i still have some good spots i am going to arizona this august because kim is going to be there and kim is uh i mean he's got a lot of obligations with his his herb collection and uh he, he and i often joke about this but he's, he's getting up there and you know you you can't always be running off and Going out in the middle of nowhere when you're when you're getting up there in years, and I think he's we're both aware of that. I mean, he knows he's he's older than the dirt that he walks on in many places, um, and so you know uh, I wanted to to see Arizona with him, do some collecting, and he'd see him in his natural habitat. Uh, it, we might maybe he'll go back to Arizona, maybe he won't. You know, that's uh, I don't know. Uh, but I, this is my opportunity to, and Angela and I would, I would like to show Angela Cave Creek Canyon and stuff like that. It's a beautiful place, and we're gonna need 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 like a week, a little more than a week getaway. You know, it'll be a partial collecting trip. You know, very casual and uh, partial, just hiking and spending some time away from it all and whatnot. So, um, but yeah, I'm trying to think of anything. There are there are updates from this room I've been thinking of. Um, Uh, platyarthrus was one thing. Platyarthrus, uh, Hoffman's eggii have started kicking out more babies now that I've been keeping them more moist. Uh, they're in one of these high vent setups, but they've started kicking out more babies, so that's good. We love that. Uh, a lot of people like uh, platyarthrus. I somebody messaged me uh, just today asking about uh, Hoffman's eggii, and uh, we we are all a very unique bunch. I can at least say that much. Now the big thing. The big thing from yesterday, and I posted this in the Discord, somebody won, and I can't, if I do a really, really hardcore digging, I can probably find the auction document, but like I tried using all the keywords I usually use for them, and File Explorer wasn't pulling it up, but I think it was the spring auction of last year where I auctioned off the first rights to buying a group of Princessia Van Weerbeckai and Rohamana. If anybody here is the person who won that or knows who won that, and I tried, I tried looking in the auction channel too. I tried looking up Andro Hamana or Princessia, and it wouldn't pull up anything um, past like one of the most recent auctions. So if you are that person who won the first right of refusal on a group of Princessia Van Rierbeckai, Andro Hamana, there is news on that. I um, I had the pair. The pair didn't do any, didn't make any babies for was it like a year, year and a half now. I lost the male two to four ish months ago, but before he passed, I put several uh, immature female uh, Van Weerbeck eye from the old uh, Cape Cod roaches stock, which TJ is convinced is 100% pure stock. I'm like 95. To 99% there. I'm not entirely convinced. I'm not seeing like the super gigantic males I used to see in in the stock before. Um, but color conformity is good. Si uh, the pronotum indent is good. So I'm like 99% there. I'd say, oh yeah, this is probably pure stock. But I, I'm not. I'm not one billion percent confident. But anyways, so I took females from that stock which is doing well for me and i virgins and i put them in with the um with the male andro homana and uh they matured and then the male died and i thought oh maybe it's, there's been some overlap between him being alive and the females being sexually mature maybe you know maybe not so i put the three female virgin three female cape cod roaches old cape cod roaches stock and the Androhamana female stock into one enclosure together. And nothing happened, nothing happened, nothing happened. And I thought, okay, he didn't mate the females. This is not going anywhere. And then yesterday I check on them. And 
there's a bunch of babies, like 60 to 80 babies in there. All the same instar, all second instar. So they were born this month and they molted um, at some point without me noticing. I mean, I don't usually check through everything in there except for once a month. And the Androhamana female was dead. And I pulled her abdomen apart, which was, looked like she had been dead for maybe like two weeks or something. I pulled her abdomen apart. I couldn't find an ooth in there. I looked at the three females from the other line, and they were in varying stages of plumpness. And it's basically, I do not know if these babies are pure androhamanas from the female before she died, or if one of the females from the other line that I crossed the male with produced them. This huge litter size is not usual for this for the old Cape Cod roaches strain of Princessia. It seems like it's more like 30 to 40 ish, not like 40 to 60. This is just crazy. I'm inclined to think that they're all from the same litter because of the synchronization of the molting, which is a, usually you will see that you'll grow up a cohort and they'll, you know, they'll, as they get older, males will be mature before females, etc. And so there's some breakaway later in the development, but early on when you have this very tight knit, okay, they're all molting at the same time. They're all the same in star. It suggests that that's a cohort of the same litter. So I have the Schrodinger's Androhamanas now where worst case scenario they're 50% Androhamana and 50% old Cape Cod roaches line. So they're still Princessia. They're just not pure locality now. Or they could be pure Androhamanas. So I need to get in touch with that person and tell them, hey, I don't have the pure stock. Nobody in the U.S. does. Nobody in the U.S. has a functioning colony of pure stack Androhamanas anymore. Um. But I have these, they're guaranteed 50% at least. And if not 50%, 100% because they may have been from the, the original female before she passed when I improved the enclosure quality. So um, that's where we're at. It's also why on the auction promo material, I put a picture of that male, Andrew Hamana. And I'm glad I have that picture too because now I have a good standard to go off of for selecting to create a androhamana esque line. Uh, and I'm going to have to pick a good name for it because I don't want them to be confused with pure androhamanas, which it was sounded like we were never going to get another opportunity to work with the pure stock again. It now seems that that is not the case. It seems like there may be some popping up this summer sometime. That's not guaranteed, though. I can't live my life expecting that. So I now need to focus on getting a functional group of this Androhamana phenotype going and selecting um, and also a good strain name for them that indicates that they're different from the other Princessia lines, that they are from the Androhamanas, but they are not pure Androhamanas. Because if we do get the pure ones again, and then we got these two lines going, inevitably they will be mixed up if they have any anywhere near similar in a name they have to have completely different strain names and then people will treat them as if they are completely separate sacred entities so um i'm gonna have to figure that out i have some people to talk to about what to name this strain because it's, it's like 60 to 80 super healthy babies this is great this is uh you know that's some insane fecundity which is why i Two sides you could see it was one. Oh, it was the outbreeding. I bred the one strain to the other strain, and then we got all this vigor. But that would make sense in a survivability of embryos sense, but not in a number of healthy eggs produced by the female sense, which is more something that, that is innate to the – this is a chick or the egg question, basically, is – the female that produces the egg case has to be in good health genetically, physically, blah, 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 to produce a large, complete egg case with 60 to 80 viable eggs in it. For you to get 60 to 80 viable babies out of that egg case, they also have to not have any genetic defects or anything that would cause them to die in the embryo stage or die before or immediately after hatching. So... You can make both arguments in this situation. 
what am I inclined to feel? Again, I am not familiar with the average number of clutches for the uh, Andrew Hamanas. Uh, I was told that the person who has worked with them the longest says that it's an average clutch size for a for Princesia. Um, and yet this is much larger than the average clutch size for many hissers that I've seen. So um, I'm just going to wait. Some other things that would say um, – some other things that would suggest that these – are outcrossed that the male made it with the other line of Princesia. Some evidence that I would see for that would also be um, very high diversity in these F1 crosses when they mature. If I look at the phenotypes and they're all over the place, you got some with a lot more markings, some with no markings, blah, blah, blah. That would suggest that uh, the outbreeding did occur. If there's ridiculous consistency, then I am inclined to say, ah, okay. So they all look pretty much the same. So that suggests that this already inbred colony of Androhamanas did, you know, these high preservation of these characteristics. Therefore, um, this is probably from a pure cross. This is probably the original pair that made these. So that's exciting for me. I'm happy to still have Androhamanas genetics in my colonies i really hope we do get the pure ones i think my problem was i kept them too dry initially i think i kept them too dry i only had a pair i really there it was out of my hands to be able to get more than just a pair but i think if i had a group of five pairs of adults even if i had a poor setup i would have still gotten offspring and still gotten them established is what i truly feel so that's the andrew Hamana con commentary um so woo we can probably get that phenotype isolated. The the really big, gnarly male phenotype, very, very impressive, robust hissers. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I cannot guarantee that it's pure stock. I can only say, oh, yes, it's likely that these are pure, but because I put those other females in there, I cannot absolutely guarantee it. So good news, bad news. We, we take what we can get. Exotic Willing says, Kyle, I saw Thorax Porcelana on the auction floor. Have you been breeding them? I have been breeding them. They're doing wonderful for me. I actually split the colony um, as a safety precautionary measure uh, two, three weeks ago. And, uh, yeah, they're doing great for me. They will be up for grabs in the auction. Awesome species. Um, just all awesome species. Full stop. Uh I think I got them in September, right before the other auction or right after the other auction. And there's some adult, some of the males are starting to kick it. That makes sense. You know, Epilamprony and, you know, they're not the longest lived of roaches, except for Pistoplatia. Um, Epilamprony, kind of shorter, shorter lived on the roach life expectancy spectrum. Uh, so getting six stay months out of the adult males is, uh, I think that's a big thumbs up. Uh, females are all, I think I lost one female that had a wing deformity and other than that, all still going well. So nifty little roaches, uh, wonderful little quirky fellows and, uh, probably the, one of the best climbing roaches I've ever seen. The new setup that I have for them, I've completely abandoned trying to use a barrier to keep them in. They just have an underlay and they don't seem to accrue underneath it. So that's good. Uh, Elsie asked me if the uh, Othika from the Erin Vega sent hatch yet. Nope, I have not found any hatchlings. I've had maybe two to four of those Erin Vega die, just miscellaneous nymphs, and um, <clears throat> the rest are doing fine. There are the, nothing from the Uths there. This could be a, oh, they needed to dry out and rehydrate. Oh, they needed to be uh, cooled in the winter. Some of these, some of these non-Arizona, non-New Mexico, non-Texas, Air to Vega have quirks and I'm still figuring them out, but they get misted once a day. It's high ventilation. I cannot think of a better setup for them. They're, they have, they're right where are they? they're right there. That's their enclosure. It's just filled with the substrate you sent with them straight from their wild habitat. So I'm doing all I can basically. Satchel found some monomerous today. Only three individuals. You still want them. Um, not sure if I'll make it back to them. Sure, I'll take them. I'll play around with them. My um, 
Let me look at my glomerous enclosure on, on, on stream. Oh, I did not think this through. There we go. So this is this is a new glomerous style enclosure thing that I'm, I'm trying out. You got the plaster of Paris on the bottom. It's got one vent hole. I might even take the lid off during the summertime because of how humid it gets. And we're trying, we're trying all kinds of stuff. We got the white white rot wood at the front here. We got uh, white rot wood at the front. We got some really well rotted cottonwood leaf there. Just one, just to try it out. We got a little piece of cottonwood or willow bark. We got uh, some brown or red rot on the side here. And then we got a pile of uh, this is one of those like annual mosses. I think it is. Um, that just grows on some sandbags that I have. I got a, a good good bunch of this moss here. Glomerous pustulata, yes, thank you, uh, Alan. We see what Joseph Sarma says. Oh, wait, while you're, we're doing auction talk, are any of your Bersatria doing well enough to offer them? I've got a vacant bin. Yes, there should be. I think all four Bersatria should be at the auction, should be. Um, so, so far, like Oren had said, they are really preferring that moss. Now, there's I say that, and this is the first time. Let's see if I can get this angled right. I want it. You can see right here, there's one who's decided to come out on the cottonwood leaf. This is the first time. Let's get this thing to focus if I can. It doesn't want to. We'll keep workshopping it. Well, I said we'll keep workshopping it, and it will focus, is what I said. And it's going to do that. Well, if I get way back here, we keep this up front here. Whoa. Okay, well, now it decides to focus a little bit. But that's literally the first time that I've seen one of them out of the moss that I put in here. When I say moss, I don't mean, like, they're not eating the top of the moss, which Orrin was very clear about. They're tucked up underneath the moss, eating the dead stuff or the, like, fake vasculature on the undersides. There's a lot of poop here. I also put a pair of Project Armadillidium in here because the first time that I had success with Glomerus um, was... Uh, in an or second time, second time I had success with glomerous. Um, second time I had success with glomerous was in an enclosure where I thought, oh, all the pill millipedes died. I'll uh, let me just uh, get, let me just reuse this enclosure and put some armadillidium in here, and I put vulgari in there, and then I went to water once, and I sprayed it, and all of a sudden, like fifty pill millipedes half grown of glomerous pulchra, I think it was, or pulchra peas came up out of it. So um so yeah, so that this is going really well. I haven't had any deaths from the pill millipedes. The obviously the isopods are not eating them. So we're gonna see how this goes. It's going well. Uh, I may try this same style with the anomerous that I'm being sent. I may switch the uh, anomerous or CF anomerous that are still alive from Auburn last year to this style setup and see how it goes with the brown rot wood or what have you and mm -hmm. see what we see what we can do. And uh, yeah, so there, there's some success. Again, Oren told me that and, you know, I thought, oh, well, I'll just feed them brown rot or red rot, but they show a very notable preference for this very specific thing. And another theory I had about it is in the wild, I've seen countless species of millipedes eating moss, shoving their face into the moss, eating whatever's underneath it, etc. I've seen, what's that one? Is that Bassion or Cambala from the south? Uh, one of those two genera, Narcius, Julids, Oxidus, all kinds of stuff, eating moss. My pet theory, a mouse. Um, my pet theory is that with millipedes being one of the first terrestrial animals and moss being one of the first terrestrial plant lineages, uh, it's it's a primordial food for them. 
that they basically have a pre-adaptation for digesting it and eating it and have a fondness for it. And that is, that runs what they've been on land for what, 400 million years or something like that. And that preference that maybe even seeking out moss is just something very deep rooted in their biology. So deeply rooted in their genes from 400 million years of, of, relying on it or switching back to it or what have you that all of them are just very fond of it so that's my thought is it's probably a fail safe food for a lot of different millipedes if you want if you're desperately trying to breed something so um we're gonna see how that goes i have reasonable hopes if i have both sexes in that group i have a lot of this moss available to me and the best part about it is I know how to farm this moss, and it's not difficult. And that is very appealing to me because I would like to have sustainable products available in the future, and I would like to be able to tell people exactly how to do something like this. Here's how you raise these pill millipedes. Here you go. Here's exactly how you do it. Super easy, but you need this one thing. So... um. Braden says, how about Princessia andro Andromedia? Like, media is in half Andromana and also. I want to avoid it sounding too close to the original as possible because people will mix it up. People, people are mixing up as, like, with the Magic Potion Isopod situation. They're mixing, they mix that up. Oh, is it this? Is it that? Magic Potion. Now we've got Magic Potion Granulatum and Depressum, which is fine, but. Um, the problem is who, who, what casual keeper out of the, I guess, maybe tens of thousands of hundreds of thousands of maybe even millions at this point in the U.S., who is going to go to an expo and see a cup labeled, as they are at expos, Magic Potion Isopod? Who is going to go and have the skills, the knowledge, and even just the thought that they should check to see what species they're buying? To look at that and say, oh, yes, these are clearly Armadillidium vulgare, the, uh, magic, the original magic potion line from this vendor that I am at at this big reptile expo. Clearly, that is what these are. That is going to be like the 1% of even bug people. So more likely it could be anything. It just says magic potion. They could take it home and realize it's depressing or what have you. So um, I want to avoid that. My strongest case for giving them a unique name, not even having, not even having shared names in, in like cultivar names and stuff with uh, things like roaches and isopods is to this day, somehow people seem to have mostly kept their black tiger hissers pure and unmixed with other species or strains of hissers. The common name for the strain is so powerful that people have not mixed the two. From everything that I've seen and heard, people are not actively mixing the two. Maybe maybe I heard once or twice five to ten years ago, some guy at a show would be like, oh, yeah, I tossed them in with my regular hissers, and now they're all kinds of colors. Okay. Um, but mostly people come at me and shows, hey, hey, yo, I got those black tiger hissers from you, man, like four years ago. And, man, there's like a whole tank full of them. It's great. Um, people never say anything like, oh, yeah, they started dying, and I had to mix some more of another whatever in that I got from somewhere. So I need to pick a good name to keep the strain labeled that isn't doesn't even sound like Androhamana. Although, you know, people who want pure Androhamanas will know, oh, yes, there's a difference between these two strains and blah, 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 and they'll be willing to pay. But I feel a moral obligation to help do risk, me, risk mediation with stuff like this, which is also why one of the new black uh, hisser cockroach lines that I'm coming out with uh, doesn't even have black in its in the name. It's a solid black slash dark purple hisser strain of a different line than black tigers and regular portentosa. And uh, it's gonna it's has an entirely different name. It doesn't even have black in the name in English and whatnot. So um so that 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 will help there. People even people are gonna mess them up visually, obviously, but 
at least the pure stock will have the name associated with it. Um, Luch says, I can see it. They eat the dirt under the moss, not dirt, but get what I mean. Um, in the wild, again, before, the last times I bred glomerous and anomerous, no moss, no moss involved. It was some sort of it was well-rotted wood of some sort. It was round or red rot for the uh, pulchra and the maculae, glomerous maculatus. And it was, I think it was a white rot wood for the anomerous and there was no moss involved, and they bred abundantly, and then they were gone. So um, I would like to get more consistency, obviously. And I want to figure out what, what, what did I do right? What am I doing wrong now with some of these species? Uh, Joseph Sarma says, wonder if mosses have less in the way of secondary metabolites, and that's why peeds seem to like them. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about that. It's, uh, is it could be. I don't know. I don't know enough about the biochemistry of mosses to to say that. Um, I would think if they were extremely palatable, they wouldn't be as common as they are in places. I would think they would get devoured by hungry invertebrates uh, left and right constantly because of that lack of protection and the fact that there are so many detritivores and whatnot that share similar habitat preferences to mosses so i don't know but uh again that's that's my little cozy theory is that they're well acclimated to moss they've had 400 million years to do that and it's comfort food for them she toss some liverworts their way and see if they touch it. a little pile of ratio or ratio carpos uh, i don't have either of those two genera but um you know i'm not against it but also i've I get in good results. It's been over a month. They've molted. They no deaths. I only got five of them. Nothing's died. There's lots of poop. There's a good, healthy Springdale population of small silvers in the enclosure. We're just gonna, we're just gonna leave them be. Is is my sentiments? We're just gonna let it, let this play out. When they seem to start getting low on some mossiness, I'll go outside and I'll scoop up some more and. We'll, we'll we'll add it in. Magic potion fakes, yeah. Name them eats other roaches. Well, then people might want them. Chris, if I call them eats other roaches, uh, let's see. Let's see. There's other stuff. We talk about the andromanas. Talk about the pill mill things. I'm gonna put these back. I don't know why having them over here makes me nervous. Um, other stuff that's going on. We're gonna show bugs. We have people wanting to show bug. We'll do a show bug. Hello, bug. We're going to show you. Okay, come on. You are overpositing in the wrong place. It is a bad place to lay eggs. Park your ass. Park your ass there. All right, this uh, this is an adults-only channel. This is not children's content. We got some copulating uh, Loxahatchee lubbers here. And let's see. Sun's down far enough. Can I use natural light, please? Okay. Yeah, let's do that. That's a that's a that's a Kino look there. Um, kind of looked like what's that one guy? Was it Blade Runner? The guy looking up at the screen with a woman on it, and he's like. The, the glows on his face and whatever. Um, anyways, this is uh, captive bred. We will have both captive bred and wild caught lubbers uh, on the uh, at the auction. Obviously, I had to put one of these guys for the uh, for the promotional material. This is, you know, I, I need to get the Louisiana ones again. I get them. I keep them going for a generation. Then I lose them because I suck sometimes. But these guys have been going for. This is my second hatch of Loxahatchies, and I just cannot get enough of them. Um, the, the, the lighting is not showing off their colors to the to the best right now, but it's do I have a way to show off their colors to the, the best possible right now? Uh, we'll say we'll save it for the move uh, when we get good fancy lighting and all that stuff. I'm I'm really gonna go into the the YouTubers. Yeah, I don't even, I don't even 
I love we have 22 people here. This is phenomenal. This is this is exactly what I had hoped for. Even better, we're two people over how many regular viewers I, I could have ever fathomed or hoped for. And that just makes my 23. Look at this. This is insane. This is literal insanity. Um, but I want to give you guys the best experience. So we're gonna get I'm gonna get all that fancy professional streamer stuff. I uh, got just a snippet of it now. We're going to get all we're gonna get all the good stuff. We're going to go right and we're going to use it. We're going to do an auction and that money's going to get, you know, at some point going to get funneled right into the backlighting and the boom mic. I mean, this stuff's I mean, this stuff is pretty good, but we're going to go real hard on that stuff. So, you know, when I pull out stuff like this, everybody ooze and ahs even more. Uh, and I can show you how beautiful these are because you get the male. This locality has. Are you going to nibble on me? You're thinking about it. The female's thinking about nibbling on me. Everybody, um, maybe, maybe not. Um, the male is that this orange. You only get this orange color in this Loxahatchee area. Uh, Satchel, I probably will pending, um, pending a couple things. But also, you live there, so I can pretty much pester you for them anytime. The uh, for some reason, it's hard to get those Louisiana ones. Um, and actually, that road that you found them on, Satch, I will not dox the location here, but. Anyways, um, the road that you found them on, Satchels, had the biggest and the blackest that I have ever seen. So I need to find somebody who's willing to go to that road and collect that locality again because I want – if I'm going to put the time and effort into raising the stock um, and these guys, they're not a lot of work, but they are kind of resource intensive. Uh, I mean, it's, you, you, don't, you don't realize – how difficult it is to keep a bunch of romaine lettuce on hand until you need like one head of it every two weeks in addition to your own needs. You know, their food is sharing precious fridge space with my own is the bottom line here. So um, we're, we're just going to ignore the turd. We're just going to ignore the turd. And I don't think any of it got on my keyboard. I hope not. I mean, it's just, it's just dirt, but still. Um. So I have a couple localities that I want to end up being like, these are my, these are my big guys, my last, you know, like my, my hundred percent, you know, I'll, I'll get wild caught in when and where I can, but there's a handful of localities and like, yeah, we're going all in. We're going to make sure these guys stay propagated um, all, all the time. So, but this Loxahatchee, I may start selecting for the orange. I haven't been selecting for the orange, but this bottom one, this female, and it's not sex related. You get males and females of both of these colors. This bottom one, I you never see this color anywhere either. You see those yellowy ones. Uh, those are mostly out of north central Florida. And then you go really far south and you see them again in the Keys. Um, you see the gray, sort of a mixture of different colored ones from um, like Alabama and southern Georgia and uh, the more northern Louisiana. Um but you don't see it's like this is a it's like a lemon yellow it's very different from that really like golden you see in the central florida stuff and uh i think you know i'll probably start breeding for for both of these i need to get my general numbers up and to do that i need more space i need to be able to mass rear these and i am not able to mass rear them currently I'm on the cusp of that. We have a season where I can get some good wild caught stock of new localities in. And I'm going to be, you know, the moves coming in. I'm going to have a bunch of space pretty soon. But right now, things are a little, we're a little, we're, we're a little suboptimal. So um, you got these raunchy lubbers that gets views apparently. Yeah, we've drawn in some people. But, you know, these are, lubbers are great. They're great. Eastern Eastern lubbers are great. Horse lubbers are not very great. Guys, um, just if if you're like holding, if you're the thing that's stopping you from getting Eastern lubbers is you want horse lubbers, stop it. Get some help because horse lubbers suck. Horse lubbers really, really suck. And I like them. I like their colors. You know, maybe one day I'll get, I'll do hybrids. I'll do a hybrid of, of horse lubbers and eastern lubbers and see, you know, what traits I can get out of the horse lubbers onto the eastern lubber 
build and whatnot, but horse lovers are smaller than eastern lovers on average. They're not as colorful, and you know, they have unique colors, but they're not as colorful. They live shorter than eastern lovers do. They have much longer incubation times and inconsist inconsistent hatching under variable hatching conditions, I found out as well, too. And they they, they kind of eat each other more-ish. Maybe it was I didn't feed enough. Maybe it was something else. But they are notably more cannibalistic than eastern lovers are. So it's like, why would you want the thing that's smaller, shorter-lived, takes longer to hatch? Not It's just, just not a good option compared to eastern lovers, in my experience. Again, not saying I won't work with horse lovers again, but you know, if you want captive bred horse lovers, that's a lot of stuff to coordinate and a lot of things to plan around. And they're not going to be Jimmy's first pet grasshopper if if you're going to have captive bred horse horse lovers. They're they're going to be for diehard fans only. They're going to be like twelve for four hundred dollars, something ridiculous like that. Um. April is probably the best time to get them from Louisiana as they're hatching out then. Yes, I'm going to. Anybody here in Louisiana? Anybody? LC, there will be Ross Burrowing Roaches. This is a bug which means I go through an inventory. My entire collection, everything gets inventoried and put on the on the auction spread. So their Roth Eye are doing well, so there will be Roth Eye at the auction. Um. Let's see, I need the line. I'm in the east to see tons of them on the property. I never what what species? Oh, just grasshoppers? Yeah, people love grasshoppers. They just um grasshoppers are not pe people are let me turn on the light. People are are just now coming around to pet non tarantula, scorpion, etc. bugs. Um you know, people people are dabbling in millipedes and they're finding that, oh, this is a little bit more tricky than I expected. I'm not getting babies. I'm not getting, you know, oh, it takes three years to get an adult. Well, that's that's kind of, oh, it's a pet. I'll, I'm fine with just one. Um, people are just coming around to, like, having pet bugs that need more than just a tarantula does, basically. I really do not want to sit here with this turd on my hand. I'm going to go put our friends away, and I'm going to wash this turd off of my hand. I will be right back. All right. Um, let's see. You need to start working with some of the cooler Latrodexa species for no specific reason. I did work with. I've worked with quite a few widows in the past, actually. Um, the problem is, everybody wants widows until you go to sell them one, and then they don't want it. <laughs> is in my experience. Maybe that will be different with the Roach Crossing relaunch and cultural blah 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 about latrodectus but um you know there was a time where i was bringing what was that species mediterranean black widows tradecum gutatus and i had them available pretty regularly in like 2015 2014 2015 2016 and nobody wanted them and maybe that's i don't know why uh, i had uh, was a polygulus too nobody wanted them I was asking like, I don't know, $10, $15 for a fourth, fifth instar sling, and nobody nobody cared. So I know things change over time, but um, that stuff is not easy to get and to maintain in breeding groups. And so, you know, it, was, it uh, discouraged me from really going into Latrodectus hardcore. Now I will probably keep Bishop Eye again. I did quite well with Bishop Eye. Um, 
and uh, maybe I'll try other species if I'm offered groups of slings. Maybe. But uh, for now, it's uh, the building. The building has to uh, has to come first before really branching out into some of these other ventures. And that's a strictly business decision. Again, not, not saying I wouldn't take some a bulk group of a cool Latrodecta species right now because I would, but I'm not going to go actively seeking it out is what I'm saying. So um, has anyone tried working with Atlanticus? I had um, one of my wholesale suppliers for stuff like Narcissus Gordonis sent me a good size Atlanticus from Florida and um, they laid a bunch of eggs. I got a bunch of hatchlings and then I, they all died. And I tried, I tried a couple different setups. And if I could do it again, I think I would have done like a mantid enclosure. I would have done um, a mesh cube. And I would have hosed it down once or twice a day. And I would have filled it with um, I was giving them pallid roaches. I think they were eating them, but they were also eating some fruit. So I would workshop what I'd feed them. And uh, that's that's what I'll do because I will inevitably be sent another one and uh, will inevitably find more on a future trip. And that's what I'll do. But the, the problem with some of that stuff is it's just not, it's not very feasible to raise them in captivity sometimes. The cannibalism and and marketing them and you know by the you put so much work into some stuff and by the time some people have interest in it it's like oh well i didn't see nobody was interested for x amount of time so i got out of the project uh, and obviously i avoid doing that with stuff like roaches and all the other cool stuff that i work with but with some of those other things it's like oh yeah, this is a shot shot in the dark at success um the horn one says, "You have anything that gives you the heebies? Uh, large centipedes give me the heebies. I have a tremendous amount of respect for large centipedes, but that does not mean that they don't give me the heebies." Uh, Satchel put Atlanticus in a cup once and they died. <laughs> Kyle, do you currently keep carnivorous plants? Do I? Do I? No. No, I've avoided getting indoor commitment plants until. Oh, I have I have one I have one Nepenthes that that's in the the uh, bioactive in the guest room. There's one Nepenthes in there that maybe produced like one pitcher last year. That's it. <laughs> um, my neighbor Joe, I gave him one or two pinguicolas, and in the way that he keeps them, they've just completely infested the things that he put them into. So uh, I guess I can I can claim vicarious uh, success through him in this situation. I'm sure, you don't have any U Gibba in your tanks. Let me look that up. No, I uh, I don't. I'm almost positive. I kind of would want that. I would think I would like that um, in my tanks. It would. Uh, I mean, we need a lot of seed shrimp. It is nifty. I wouldn't mind. Wouldn't mind at some point getting some of that. Um, yeah, I, I don't don't really have any carnivorous plants again. I, I find them interesting. I would like to keep them, but I'm trying to with the move coming. I'm trying to keep my priorities as straight as possible. My priorities being, oh, is new cool roach available? Okay, dump tons of money on that because I love roaches. Um, isopods and train all right let's get some of those millipedes all right let's get some of those but like new projects that kind of will require me to rethink how i keep stuff or like tackle stuff this also reminds me i need to text somebody about finding zealous longipes um oh hey there is an assassin bug on flowers literally in your area that I really need ASAP. All right, that's done. Um, 
Kyle, what is your favorite house plant you keep that you particularly enjoy? With answers like this, I with things like this, I got to go with my gut response. I had an initial knee jerk response, and then I had another more of a oh yes, like let let it let the answer percolate up from the the, the depths of your soul and synthesize with your brain. And the gut response is the Calesia fragrance, the um, the variegated one. There's like a couple variegated ones, but there's the one that I have the most experience with and that I have not killed in any situation yet is like the one with a very thin uh, variegation. I love that plant so much. It's great. I love that that thing. It's so un unkillable and it grows so vigorous, vigorously. When it flowers, it feels like a treat. And um, I need, I did kill the purple, the solid, but like purple tinges, edges of the leaves variety of that. And I really need to get that back. Actually, Satchel, you might have that plant still. Did I give you one of those? If I, if I did, I kind of want a piece of it back if you got extra. Um, so I love Calesia fragrance. I love all the Camelinaceae. I really love that. Um, people don't really grow it as a house plant. I have it seeded into some of my pots outside and like, cracks and like the little protected areas in the little uh fenced in nursery thing um but there's the ink ink spot plant and i always forget the latin name but it's a camelinaceae it's from south america it's got like those really trippy it's got big blotches on the leaves dark purple leaves dark purple stems purple flowers um i can't remember what's called but it's camelinaceae camelinaceae um now for the, the deep percolation favorite house plant would be um, cast iron plant, just the wild species. I do have a, a spotted variety, um, Aspidistra eladior. There's, I have the spotted species or the spotted variety too, and I do like that. And I really need to get that into a bigger pot where it can shine. But I think a lot of people sleep on cast iron plant, Aspidistra eladior. I put it outside for four to seven months it grows some fresh growth i bring it inside in the winter a couple of couple of the leaves die you know when the whole leaf turns yellow you just pluck it out from the base um survives over watering survives under watering survives like no light and here dead of winter i've got this big bushy green house plant in the corner of my kitchen that i don't have to do anything to except for the fact that this is just my house is so dusty from the dogs from probably not from the bugs from the dogs all from the dogs um i'll have to wipe the individual leaves off with a wet uh towel um after a couple months because they start to get dusty but the plant doesn't care so i really love cast iron plant if you um if you have the space to really get the bigger the just straight species of lady or and let it shine it is a it's a great plant it used to be more popular indoors it almost it looks fake um but I love it. So um, you sent me some of your variegated one. I sent you my solid one. Yeah, I need the, I need the solid one. I couldn't remember if I got it from you or if I got it from a store or something. Um, but yeah, I, I need the solid one. I love that plant so much. Um, yeah, so that's favorite house plant. You know, I, I got like some spider plants. I've had all, all kinds of other stuff over the years and, um, you know, like a Thanksgiving cactus, and I have a, a Pharaoh's mask. What are those? Elephant ears, alocasia, Pharaoh's mask, alocasia. I really love. Um, I was told I had to keep it growing over the winter, so I got like I bought a big vase at a at a thrift store. I just slammed like right before our first hard frost. I just slapped the whole plant in there. I dug it out of the pot with the dirt dripping from the roots i just slapped it in the vase and uh watched it die over the course of a month and a half and then it set up some new growth and then it died back i was like oh it's gonna be gross and i'm gonna live and then it set up some new growth i was like yeah we're getting some leaves and then it died back like, oh okay it's finally dead set up some new growth oh yeah here we go and now we're in march and the new growth looks like it's not just gonna suddenly it's not just gonna quickly die so i'm like oh yeah we made we made it we, we did it guys we're we're through the winter this thing i'm gonna throw it outside it's gonna triple in size in like a month the second it warms up so um but really i'm saving a lot of my indoor plant enthusiasm you know i've kind of gone found out some stuff i like 
seen some stuff, places. Oh, yeah, that would be neat in a greenhouse. And all of those are being pushed into here and will be fully realized and fleshed out when I build the conservatory when I move. The conservatory will happen within the next five years probably, and it's going to be at least 50 by 100 feet year-round heated, and that is where I will put all of my Ah yes, my plant, my plant collection will go in the conservatory, you know, and I'll have some I'll have some other greenhouses here and there for extending season extending on like crop type stuff like kales and um, kales and lettuces that kind of those kind of things. But um, I'm I've said this before I'm I'm tired I'm tired of all this being around me twenty four seven it. I love it so much. I don't have to be immersed in it 24-7 to prove that I love it. I'm having a building built for all of this stuff to be in. I need to get away from it so I can go into work and appreciate it as much as I want to. And so um, so the future house will be will not have much of an animal or life form presence. The way that I look at it, is you know i have all these all these enclosures for the bugs and i gotta make sure they're healthy and happy and i'm meeting all their needs i need a human enclosure is what i need i need i need the 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 human hide and the 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 basking spot and the 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 water dish for the human i need a human enclosure for me you know so um Satchel, I think I might have seen cast iron plant in your yard. It is evergreen. Like they, they plant as a landscape plant in Alabama and Florida and Louisiana. Uh, but up here it's you keep it indoors or heavily protected. But it's it's really slept on as a house plant. I've only seen it at major like house plant section slash stores like a handful of times in the last 10 years. Anthony Green says, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, but are there any native things that can be made into house plants? That is such a tough question. Because so many things need diapauses um, and dormancies of different sorts. But um, the USDA APHIS or Forestry Service website says that the rattlesnake plantain, um, which is actually an orchid, makes a good terrarium subject. Um, so maybe you could, you, you, you could keep something like that. Um, a lot of aquatic plants, as long as you don't trigger them into dormancy in my experience they'll keep growing like hornwort is a pain if you collect it like or maybe if you collected it out of uh if you collected in michigan right now or if you collected it further south in like january or february and you just threw it into a into a tank it, it'll it might just rot and break down it won't break dormancy like it's it just too sudden um bringing a small piece up to room temperature or whatever uh, but if you get it, if you go to out in Michigan in the middle of the summer, you get a piece of hornwort, you throw it in an enclosure, and it never experiences short days, it never experiences cold water, et cetera, it will just keep growing forever, and you don't need to die. Pause. The same thing like Elodia and some other aquatic plants. Um, but for terrestrial plants, that's a, it's a more difficult question because so many of them need, like, chill hours, and the ones that don't are usually annuals or biennials. So... Um, so it's one of the nice things about the conservatory is even though it's going to be heated, I don't think I'm going to be able to afford to, or probably don't even want to keep it at like 85 degrees in the dead of winter. It's like, if you go in there and it's 70 to 80 degrees in the winter in Michigan, it's going to feel like it's 90 walking out of a cold house or in from a cold outdoors. It's going to feel scorching hot. Um, even if it's not actually that warm and, even just having like the daylight hours dropping from natural lighting and um, even just a little, just a little bit of a temp drop uh, between the average during the summer and the winter, I should be able to, to keep some North American native plants in there that would need a diapause, um, but that are from further South. So stuff from Alabama, Florida, Northern Florida, um, should be able to just be kept in there. It's just a part of the, the flora and fauna. It'd be a really, the, one of the coolest greenhouses I ever went to. 
Um, it wasn't a formal greenhouse. There's a place in southeastern Ohio called Glass House Works. I think it's still there. Um, the owner is an older guy, and um, yeah, maybe I don't think he's passed by now. But anyways, um, there's a bunch of greenhouses in the back of the property that sometimes you need permission for some of them. Sometimes you don't. Um, the guy that I was with is kind of a friend of the owner, but not that good of a friend. And uh, he kind of snuck into the back greenhouses to look around for weird stuff. Cause you know, it could be a little weed that they got in, in like the seventies and it's growing in the bottom of the greenhouse. And they thought, Oh, nobody's going to want to buy this. And then some guy with a plant obsession goes and they're like, Oh my gosh, this is that aroid I've been looking for for years. I got to have some. Um, but I went into one of those, the overgrown back greenhouses before, and it's just, it was such a alien blend of plant life. It's, it's something I've never, almost never seen in like nature, like the texture, the, the way the plants were interacting with each other was just completely alien in that back greenhouse because, you know, it's heated just enough in the winter to like keep tropical subtropical stuff going and but but that stuff isn't growing so out of control because of that the weather in the winter mm -hmm. as to smother out the native weeds and uh cold hardy stuff that snuck in there over the years or spilled in so they get the climbing fig but then the climbing fig is like grasping on to like some uh uh not Boston Ivy. It's another species of Parthen Parthenosis. Um, not Virginia creeper. Woodbine. Woodbine. So you got like the creeping fig wrapped fighting with the, the woodbine. You got like a huge cycad in a pot that's just got all these weird oxalis and uh, other stuff growing out of it. And it, it was it was like when people draw those pictures of like alien planets, you know, and they like kind of like avatar-esque, you know, those are the images you see from fancy creative types sometimes. And they got the person climbing out of their little space rocket thing and they're like looking up at like some tree-like organism that's like 500 feet tall. And then there's like a bunch of other weird shapes and textures of plant-like life forms all around it. That's how I felt going into that greenhouse. Um, but anyways, so you, it has the potential to make some very interesting aesthetics, things that are very paradise-like but unnatural for stuff, I guess, for, for life on this planet. <clears throat> so, um, so that's my rant on that. Any other, any other thoughts or questions that, that might set me off? We're, we're over an hour, hour and 17 minutes here. Reminder to like the video for everybody who's here, by the way. Anybody else have any questions or comments on anything? I uh, This has been a good live stream. I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep going a little bit longer. I don't have my car. I can't go do anything. I, you know, I might I might walk up to the 7-Eleven on the corner and pick up like a coconut water or something. I'm like, I get bored without the car. I, th I think I'm just nervous. I think I'm nervous because this integral part of my life is gone and I can't do anything about it basically. So there's this one weird Senecio type that snuck into one of my campus greenhouses. It's so out of place looking at some East Asian genus. What is growing in your guest room bioactive? Uh, guest room bioactive has that one Nepenthes. It has that one Calesia fragrance. It has a hydrocotyl, a Florida native hydrocotyl that I think Geosasarma narrowed it down to like one or two species. Um, so it's got that. It's got um, it's got some cuttings I took from Dan's place of stuff that was just going to die in the winter. I just took it and threw it in there to see if it would root, and a couple things did. There's um, it's another Calesia. I don't think it's fragrance. A different species of Calesia with bigger variegation. There's a maiden hair fur. I think it's black maiden hair fur in the back corner. Got one of those oxalis, those like um, perennial tropical oxalis species that form like the fleshy stem. Uh, actually, about that, um, I've seen there's the purple one, there's the orange one. I really want that oxalis in wild type. Oxalis. Oxalis. So 
I brought in one of my pots was the um, Solanum Pyracanthum, the Madagascar Thorn Apple. I think it died over the winter. It was just kind of fighting a losing battle, or maybe it's just dormant. Maybe if I put it out in two months, it'll come back from the base. It's Madagascar is not a warm tropical place all the time. It's more like uh, northern Florida in some parts where it gets in the 40s or 50s in the in the wet season, the wet cold season, and then it heats up in the dry season later. But um, in that pot, however long it was outside for, and then I brought inside for, was enough time for the Oxalis stricta or – Oxalis delenii, delenii, to um, the seeds to overwinter and germinate. So there were for months a couple of little straggly Oxalis delenii or stricta um, popping up in there. And now that the daylight hours are increasing and there's more sun exposure splashing into the kitchen, the Oxalis is actually really starting to look good. It's it's looking way better than the uh, solanum that's in that pot, which is just a thorny twig right now uh, looks. Um, Oxalis Debilis. I got to look. I got to look at that. Uh, Oxalis Debilis. Oh, yeah, that's pretty neat. I think I have some of that somewhere from uh, Alabama. Oh, never mind. From... Original distribution is South America, but it's become a very cosmopolitan species. Joe has some of this growing in his hydroponic bin. I just saw it today. I was like, what is that? Did I give him one of the like Alabama oxalis? But no, it was that. Um, I like that. I also want those Australian violets, whoever it was I had those. Um, Farfugium japonicum. For the Nepenthes... I have no idea. It was a, it was a, just a random plant store in Nepenthes. I said, okay, it's three ninety nine for this little thing, and I kind of want it, so I'll get it. So I have it. Um, there's something else in the guest room, bioactive. Uh, my friend Mike has a weird undescribed peperomia because he's a very eccentric plant person. He finds himself in the right places at the right time. So he's got this undescribed peperomia. Um, that's, it's not really anything too crazy. It's got more of a like mini tree like form to it. It's got kind of roundish leaves with deep furrows in them. And, uh, I have, there's one of those in there. There's also something I got at the reptile expo. I left the tag in. It looks like a Calathea, but it's not. And it's, it has nice ornamental leaves in the, the, uh, Kalesia occasionally tries to smother and I have to cut the Kalesia back. Um, yeah, Satchel, I'm, I'm managing the Kalesia quite frequently, frequently, which is fine because people love that thing. I take a piece of it and I give it to somebody and they love it. Or I take it to the expo and I write like $4 on a leaf and Sharpie and it sells. It's, it's great. Um, you have any platydracus? I know. I, the platydracus maculosis breeding project, after I warmed them up, I was lax on giving them fresh food, and some of them ate each other. So platydracus are going on the, the back burner. That's that's a, I have a full-time employee. I'm going to have them take care of this genus in general, unless I find a better way to, to mass rear them. Oxalis is such an interesting genre. Cephalotus is also closely related to Oxalis, more so than the Penthes, even though they may look uh, extremely similar. Uh, Geososarma, yeah, that was also me with the violets. Yeah, I'm going to need some of those. That that will be, I love violets, and that will be a perfect thing to put in the conservatory. And it's something that I don't mind starting now because of how easy they are. So, um, Dewey, I'll ask him if he can get me another piece because the one that I have in the, the bioactive is not doing so well. And it's all, it is a slower growing peperomia, he warned me, but that one is not doing the best in there. I did just bump the daylight hours on that. I had it on winter hours for a bit. Now I bumped it to like spring, summer hours again. So it might start doing well. The hydrocotyl also died back when I uh, cut the hours and die back very noticeably. It was the dominant plant in that setup until I cut the hours back in November or December. And then it really took a heavy hit. It pushed up almost no new growth and um, it'll, it, it'll come back. 
it'll come back. Satchel says, have I ever mentioned I have a crazy begonia cousin? Like he takes annual trips to Southeast Asia to find new undescribed begonias to bring home and cultivate. No, you didn't mention that. Uh, Dan has a cold hardy begonia. And he gave me some propagules from it. I put them in the bioactive. Again, a lot of stuff I got from Dan that one day I just tossed in the bioactive. Um, and maybe it, it went dormant and it's going to come back or maybe it just died. But um, I'll pro- I'm going to always end up back out at Dan's every year for miscellaneous reasons. So I'll, I'll get some earlier in the season, not the little propagules they form. But it's a cold hardy in Michigan in a zone that's either I think it's a zone or two zones colder than I'm currently in. And Dan has a big patch off the west side of his house, I think. God, I love weedy begonias. They're a guilty pleasure for me. Are you just relying on window light? There's supplemental lights on them. Manios, Barina, T5. Uh, There is supplemental lights, yes, on um, on my enclosure, but... Again, it's becoming it, it. It is becoming its own ecosystem. The hydrocotyl weaves through everything. The calesia kind of blocks out stuff in the corners. The main hair fern is just off in the one corner doing its own thing. There's like the pile of cuttings and oxalis next to the big water dish in the center of it that I just kind of throw stuff into. And then there's the nepenthes that's just kind of like, yeah, I'm over here in the pot in the front left corner, and it looks okay. It's not nothing, nothing to write home about, but it's uh, it's functional. It's home to the best colony of Ligidium uh, elradii I've ever had, and I don't exactly know why, but they just love it in there. Will you take show bug requesting now? You know, I'll see. Sure, ask me to show a show a bug. You know, let's get a mega phasm out. I think I had, I think I had um, some adults mature recently. Mega Phasma. Are you a boy? Kind of look like an adult boy. Maybe adult girl. There's a boy. You got class first. All right. Might be maybe some adult male. He's really, you are really not happy, little dude. You are maybe you're freshly molten, that's why you're like this. No, you're sclerotized, he's just having a little freak out. Um, there that this this is more typical. Yep, male, he's got the, the spurs, but um, so here we go. Here's Mega Phasma. Took, took uh, three, three months. Maybe he's just horny too. It's not, there aren't any mature females yet. And usually they're just stuck to the females 24-7. So he probably feels a little bit purposeless. Maybe I should go get a nymph instead of this guy. Or maybe he just wants to be upside down. I don't know. Um, Imanis. Oh, hey. Um, yeah, give me give me those. I'll take some Kentucky locality vulgari. Um, yeah, okay. There, there we go. Calm down. Uh, Megaphasma going great. Uh, I should have maybe upwards of a of 500 to a thousand eggs this year. So we're getting these out there, everybody. Here's a here's a great pet stick bug, the easiest, uh, second maybe second easiest, tied for first easiest stick bug. Good size, U.S. native, very important um, to to many folks out there. U.S. native stick bug. Um, and of course, as a as a reliable host plant as well. Maybe we'll go. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll do a nymph. This guy's definitely on the prowl for something. Um, I love that they're just figuring out their own ecosystem. It's just going to be like that greenhouse soon. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep tossing some stuff in there at, over time. You know, I just I just wanted something green and functional was the point. And uh, I like I like being able to collect plants or. or or find a plant on my own and add it to something like that. Like the hydrocotyls from the park, one of the parking lots in uh, Destin, Florida, was just a lawn weed. I dug up a little section of the rhizome and I threw it in there. And, you know, what do you know, a year later, it's just full of it. Um, speaking of that, again, plants, native plants you can keep indoors. Hydrocotyl ranunculoides, the um, buttercup leaf uh, hydrocotyl. 
also does not the, the strain that I have does not need a die pause, does not need a uh, cold stratification. Uh, Anisomorpha are better U.S. natives. Yeah, but they don't eat red cedar, which is evergreen and a weed and everywhere. And they also will not take bone dry as the red cedar got um, last week and lasted for a whole week. And I had zero deaths of megaphasma. And, and I like those things. They're also not like this big. They're cool, and I love Anisomorpha, but the ease, the easiness is what needs to be sold to people who want a stick bug. They People are put off by freeze your oak, get ready, the, the winter, is, winter is coming uh, style husbandry that rules out a sizable chunk of people versus you tell them go look for this thing that kind of looks like a christmas tree uh a hundred feet from the freeway or that you also might have in your front yard and give them a branch of that and basically forget about them chain asks about any new springtails i've been finding some green might be isotoma viridis um my springtail collection is larger than ever but nothing new phenomenal and exciting my tomasers are doing fine. The orcasella, my velosa had a bit of a crash, but they'll be back. Kinkta are doing fine. Gricea oliveta, CF cyphoderus. I've got all the stuff from from uh, Ryan. It's not Ryan. It's Ryan, um, and from uh, Devin. Got all kinds of stuff here that I'm looking at on the on my springtail, my designated springtail shelf, but nothing, nothing too insane. Um, I'll just accrue things over time uh, with with those if I as I have done with isopods. So um, I consider it more exciting that I've had this many varieties going without critical failures for as long as I have. It's been about a year and a half since I lost like Orcasella villosa, and two two and a half years since I've lost uh, Tomasaurus vulgaris. I think I think Ryan confirmed that this new stock that I have is is vulgaris. I think I have minor in one of my enclosures downstairs too. Tomasaurus minor that I don't know where they came from, so that that's exciting. But you know, I'm I'm not like whoa, check out the new super duper ultra strawberry deluxe that I just got from Cambodia, and there's like five of them, and I took a couple pretty pictures, but they're not breeding. But just a pre order, I guess. So I don't really have that going on i'm just i'm happy to get consistency and know what to do right to continue producing things so um i hope your isotoma do well i have had short-term good results with isotoma wait do i have an isotoma pro isotoma is what i have isotoma delta is what i have had short-term results with um luch asking about stick bugs what do you feed them? Well, Megaphasma eat red cedar. This strain eats red cedar. They can also eat bramble or rose like most other stick bugs will. Um, these, what are these? What's the genus on the western shorthorn walking stick? It's something Blatchleyi western shorthorn walking stick. Parent, sorry. Parabacillus hesperus. I need to work with them for longer um, before the Latin name cements. Parabacillus hesperus. Ridiculous. Ridiculous stick bug. The, they eat grass. This is like this is like a Kai meme. Like the, the you throw it in plastic bin and it live forever. Parabacillus hesperus eats grass. Not just not just not just any grass, but any grass. I've been grabbing like weedy clusters of grass from my yards, like orchard grass and um, like winter oats and stuff that pops up in my pots. And I just kind of put it in a deli cup in the uh, parabacillus enclosure and they come up and they eat it. And then it dries out and they're like, wow, they still haven't died yet. I wonder, that's great. I just keep watering them and they keep living and not looking like they're dying. 
I went to the on my way home from Walmart like last week. They have like this bed that was like it was supposed to be. Oh yes, let's plant just a blob of daylilies, and then because nobody cares about anything anymore, especially landscaping, it became swallowed up in Canada thistle. So instead of redoing the bed or using herbicide in the Canada thistle, what do they do? They just started mowing it. Just like every month, they just come and mow everything, which is like, okay, I guess you got the Canada thistle under control, but like you killed everything else that was in there. And uh, because they've been doing that and because uh, landscaping abruptly stops at, on November 1st and doesn't pick up until about March 1st or later, um, a bunch of cool season grass, just random turf grass started is starting to take over the bed in the Walmart parking lot. And so I got out of my car. I yoinked up a, a clump of it, and I took it here. What do you know? They're eating it. So parabacillus, you know, they might even – I need to try this. I really need to try this. Um, I just didn't want to buy it wherever I – where was I? Maybe it was Petco. Man, I hate I hate Petco. Please don't get me on a rant about Petco right now, everybody. Don't don't make me do that. They, they'll never sponsor me anyway, so I guess it's fine if I do, but um, – Where's I going with this? Gra they might even eat wheat grass, like the stuff they sell at like Pet Supplies Plus and like at Whole Foods. Like they might even actually just eat wheat grass. You can, you might even be able to just feed them wheat grass. You might even be able to sprout bird seed from from the store and have them eat that. But Parabacillus hesperus, why I say one of the best, if if best starter, if not like the best pet stick bug. Because of that, the ease of feeding them is so ridiculous. And the dry tolerance, too, is another thing. Uh, you can't – most people do not have the skills, especially beginners, to keep stick bugs in low vent enclosures. You get a feel for how much humidity something likes or doesn't like, and you can kind of toy around with it for something that works for you and get a good system going. But um, – it's better to tell them to keep them ventilated and then you run the risk of things just drying out. So that's my vote for Parabacillus hesperus. They lose out on these guys because these guys are gigantic and they're also Eastern U S native. So that's where some points get allocated to mega phasma. So Alan asks, how many vulgare call localities do you have now? Like, 40 maybe not from every state though some are multiple from each state um and you know what most of them have provided me with something useful for projects or new simple recessive mutations so i'm happy for that um dewey says my tie culture crash what meal has worked best for you for springs it varies um with pedurimorphs i i've been persuaded to do the clay it uh it works well for a lot of pedurimorphs the springtail clay that ryan sells uh has worked well for pedurimorphs. It does not work for a lot of uh, larger entomobryomorphs. You you cannot keep Orcasella, Kincta, and Velosa on on a clay on a standard clay setup. They will just die. Um, Tomosterus, you might be able to, uh, but you won't get the same level of production as you will on coconut fiber with croutons over it. So. Oranges I had doing really well, and they crashed. They kind of rebounded, but then they didn't really. I did get some re a restart from uh, Devin, and they're doing fine on the clay setup. But I also took a couple and dumped them into one of my other larger bug enclosures, and I bet they will do better in there eating bug poop than they will in their own separate enclosure. Uh, essentially, I saw some red gummy springtails. Like a month ago, but I couldn't really be bothered to collect them. I'm sorry. You should be sorry, Satchel. Apologize to Ryan, not to me. Um, Chain says, yeah, I've been trying with iDelta on and off. They're such chill dudes, but they're tricky. I have really good results at first. I had them going with my Orcasella Kinkta, and then it got a little too dry during the summer. I really think I would have gotten continuous results if it hadn't gotten too dry in there because they really don't like that, and they all died, but the Kinkta were fine because Kinkta are very dry tolerant, but not as much as like uh, – Uno Strigata, those things are ridiculous. Um, but still, Luke says, I do the same thing when I see good moss or anything I can use, like great wood or white rye. I have buckets in my Jeep for that person. My wife says I'm embarrassing. Yeah, I mean, it was just more like it's like, okay, you know, if I'm if I'm going to preach how cool these are to people, I need a good example and saying, 
hey, they eat grass from the Walmart parking lot makes them sound like they're the easiest thing ever on this world and that they are pretty easy. So LC, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And uh, see you, see you next week, hopefully. So um, I, I am, you know, the Springdale clay is working really well for the pedermorphs and those, um, the lilacs are. The lilacs are thriving on it. I've scaled up. I'm working at scaling up the clay enclosures to larger style bins for the way that I sell things and keep things. And uh, we're just going to see how it goes. But, you know, trying this new setup with Orcasella, and it's not really doing what I want it to do. It's It's... Two more weeks, I will look at these new Orcasella setups and probably say, yes, this was a failure. And I will go back to focusing on mass producing them in a Faunarium style enclosure. So um, so that's that's where we're at with, uh, with, that, with that stuff. Um, hour and 40 minutes. I wouldn't mind wrapping it up now. Again, I want to go up to that 7-Eleven. So anybody have any last minute questions, comments, concerns? Again, we're... We're gearing up for the Bugapalooza auction. I appreciate all the sharing on social media, blah, 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 that you guys do with that stuff. It's very appreciated. Let's try to get to 1K subscribers so we can do another um, Roach Crossing After Dark. I have gone on record saying that I will do, I respect Roaches too much to do this, but I will do it with isopods. I will do an isopod smash or pass for the Roach Crossing After Dark session if we get to 1K subscribers. I will do that. I will probably, I don't I don't have access to an overlay, but um, not yet. But I will uh, look into doing a, uh, a tier list for that, for the uh, Isopod Smash or Pass at the Roach Crossing After Dark. I will look into getting a, a tier list maker and then i probably eventually just sharing it on the discord or what have you um good quite well, well we'll see satchel i'm not giving away that precious information until we get to that point i'm not i'm not gonna expose my my deeply rooted views on uh, isopods until we reach that precious one case of subs so uh anyways anybody anybody else questions comments when i get this little hump in my hair I think it's because I was wearing the hoodie outside with the dogs earlier. There we go. Got a little bit of a part thing going on here. Anyways. Um, any, any other questions, comments, concerns, things as we uh, we head into uh, – is it going to be April next week? I don't think just yet. No. We got one more week in March, and then we're going to already be in April. We're going to be in April by, by two wiggles from now – we're going to basically be at the auction. Actually, next week will be the last wiggle before the auction. I'm not going to do a wiggle the week of the auction. You guys are going to have me for 40 hours for three days. <clears throat> so um, thank you for another great stream, Kyle. Thank you, Anthony, with some comments on uh, dairy cows and their uh, flexibility uh, sensually. Um, yep, next Thursday starts spring break. Yep, that'll be, again, that'll be the last wiggle before the auction, and uh, hopefully it'll be as peaceful as this one. That would be nice. This is a good hour and 40 minutes. We haven't done an hour and 40 minute uh, wiggle in, a, in quite a while. So have fun setting up your new snail satchel. I hope you get them propagating and you kick off the native snail hobby in the United States with all of your obscure leaf litter dwellers. Um. All right, everybody, I'll see you all next week. And until then and beyond, may your cultures ever be bountiful. Good night, everybody.